Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was 26 years old when he became the president of the Montgomery Improvement Association. The group organized to support the boycott of the Montgomery, Alabama city bus system by some 40,000 of its African-American riders until the system of segregated seating was done away with. Dr. King was 26, fresh out of school and the new young pastor at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. The Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott began December 5th, 1955. By January of 1956, Dr. King was receiving 30 to 40 abusive and threatening letters a day from the angry white citizens of Montgomery. But the letters were not the worst part, reports historian Stephen Oates in his biography of Dr. King called Let the Trumpets Sound. The King household was also receiving 25 or more obscene and threatening phone calls every day. And they had to answer that phone because it might be a civil rights organizer on the other end with important information about a civil rights action that they needed to know about. Or it might be someone threatening Dr. King or Dr. King's wife, Coretta Scott King, who also had to answer these calls. Or it might be someone threatening their infant daughter. The barrage of threats began to wear on King. He began to jump whenever the phone rang. He was feeling fearful and exhausted. His friends like Ralph Abernathy were asking him about it because they could sense that something was wrong, but there was little they could do to help him. One late exhausted night, King answered the phone and a furious man on the other end told King that if he didn't stop, they would bomb his house. Something in King broke, he later said, and he felt like he must quit. Oates then tells what came next. King bowed over his kitchen table and he prayed aloud. Lord, Dr. King prayed, I'm down here trying to do what is right. But Lord, I must confess that I'm weak now. I'm afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership, and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers, he prayed. I have nothing left. I can't face it alone. Then King would later say he felt a presence stirring in him, and he heard an inner voice which said to him, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and I will be with you even unto the end of the world. King's trembling stopped. He felt an inner calm he had never experienced before. And King realized in his own words, I can stand up without fear. I can face anything. Now today, in our current climate, death threats have become weirdly prevalent as a tool of social and political intimidation. School board members and election poll workers and healthcare advisors get death threats. Dr. Fauci gets death threats. You could almost get inured to it unless it's happening to you. Then it's no joke. And it was certainly no joke in 1956 these were not idle threats. On January 30th, 1956, just a few days after Dr. King prayed for courage, a bomb exploded on the front steps of his home, shattering the windows and sending broken glass flying through the living room. Fortunately, King's wife and daughter were in the back of the house. King got the news while out organizing. <clears throat> Excuse me. King got the news while out organizing. He flew home comforted his family, and then convinced an angry, gathered crowd of his supporters to keep to their commitment to nonviolence and to not retaliate. On February 1st, the home of another civil rights leader, E.D. Nixon, was also bombed. In the days immediately after the two bombings, King had armed bodyguards around his home to protect his family, 
But ultimately, his commitment to nonviolence was such that he sent those guns away. Guns attract guns, he felt. He would put his trust in love. As the boycott continued, the violent threats at Montgomery escalated, but it had become clear that they would not dissuade the protesters. So in response, a grand journey was convened and called for the arrest of 89 civil rights organizers, including King, for violating an obscure old labor law prohibiting boycotts. King was in Nashville at that time, and he faced another decision. If he returned to Montgomery, he would surely be arrested, and in jail, he would be at risk of serious physical harm. Now, his parents wanted him to return to Atlanta, where he would be safe. <clears throat> but Dr. King told his father, my friends and associates are being arrested. I would rather be in jail for 10 years than desert my people now. He returned to Montgomery, was arrested, and stood trial. And in the end, he was found guilty and ordered to pay a fine. The struggle continued until November when the Supreme Court affirmed a lower court ruling that Alabama's segregation laws were unconstitutional. Dr. King had won. That night in response, the Klan paraded through the black neighborhoods of Montgomery with torches determined to intimidate black people into submission, not to take advantage of the freedom they had won. Oates reports that where before the black people would have locked their doors and stayed inside when the Klan came parading through their neighborhood, on this night they went out and sat on their porches and waved cheerfully to the Klansmen and their hateful motorcade. They knew they had won and they were not afraid. For the rest of his life, Dr. King fought for what he identified as a triumvirate of interlinked social ills, racism, militarism, and poverty. In 1956, he was fighting racism and segregation. In 1967, in a speech in New York City, he came out against America's involvement in the Vietnam War. When he was murdered a year later, he was organizing a Poor People's March on Washington and a campaign on behalf of striking sanitation workers. Underneath all of it was a vision of a world transformed by radical love, such that all people would have the opportunity for the fullest development of their person, a community in which all are cared for and included. Dr. King called this the beloved community, language which is echoed in our eighth principle, which UUI adopted this past May. And as King worked toward this vision, he attracted the hostile attention not just of racists, but of the FBI, who added to the chorus of threats that were not idle threats. There were many and powerful forces arrayed against him and threatening him all manner of harm. And yet, in the last speech he gave, the speech he gave the day before he died, he closed by saying again that he was not afraid. We need courage. Courage is counted a virtue because life in its ordinary course is risky enough. And we need to be able to deal appropriately with those ordinary risks. And then sometimes in the course of our life, that which is noblest and best within us calls us to take more significant risks, even extraordinary risks. This might not be the risk of physical harm, but then again, it might be. Labor activist Dolores Huerta, who organized boycotts on behalf of migrant workers in the 1960s, was beaten by the San Francisco police while peacefully protesting in 1988. An officer broke her ribs and shattered her spleen. They had to remove it in an emergency operation. She was 58. When we work to make real change for justice, when we threaten the systems of the powerful or even the merely comfortable, those systems can respond violently. But then there are other risks and other losses. We can lose our jobs or lose family and friends or lose clients when we risk to speak out for what we believe. Risk who bears it and the consequences 
is not evenly or justly distributed in our communities. We know this. Those who are marginalized and oppressed always risk more when they challenge systems of injustice. LGBTQ people risk all those things I named just for being who they are, just for being. Just within our system of Unitarian, of Unitarian Universalism, those religious professionals of color who speak out against their experience of the racism that lives within Unitarian Universalism often have their careers cut short. The average tenure, the average tenure of a UU minister is seven years, unless you are a minister of color, and then it is more like three to five years. And some prominent UU leaders of color who have most vocally called out the institutional racism within Unitarian Universalism have, I am very saddened to say, also received death threats. Really. To the extent that we have privilege, that privilege often functions to help insulate us from some risk. Most people are privileged in some ways and not privileged in others, right? Privilege is relative and multifaceted. We can use the privilege we do have to take risks that we can more easily bear. Speaking up, for example, when is it easier for us to do that than it might be for others? Sometimes in the process, we risk losing that privilege. When the very famous founder of, Unitarian, of American Unitarianism, the Reverend William Ellery Channing, finally spoke out against slavery in 1835 with all of his power and privilege. His well-heeled Boston congregants who formerly loved him would thereafter cross the street to avoid speaking to him. I'm sure that was painful and bewildering. Not as painful as having your ribs broken by the police, but still a risk. In the face of the real possibility of loss or harm, in the face of the real risks that life asks us to sometimes take, it is normal to face a moment where our courage fails. That's just being human. So how do we recover from those moments? Well, Dr. King prayed. And it is a testament to his character that he did not pray for safety because he knew that safety is impossible. He did not pray to be delivered from the task at hand. He did not pray for the burden of his leadership to be lifted. He did not ask for a miracle. He prayed for courage so he could continue to serve effectively, so he could lead his people in the work that needed to be done. And when his inner voice, which Dr. King identified as God speaking within him, when that voice answered him, it didn't promise him safety either. Safety is off the table. God promised presence. That's it. The voice promised Dr. King that he would not have to do the things he did alone because God would be a constant presence with Dr. King. And that was enough. Now, what does that mean in our theologically diverse Unitarian Universalist context where you may believe in a God who appears as a voice and a presence inside of us, at least sometimes, or you may not. You may not necessarily believe in a personal God or any kind of God. But is there a constant presence that ultimately serves as a ground of courage for you, as an anchor for your spirit in troubled waters? You may not have ever thought of this question or thought of it in these words, so you don't need to rush for an answer. The great 20th century pastor Howard Thurman, mentor to Dr. King and many civil rights workers and also to many Unitarians, once wrote, keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve that in fair weather or in foul, in good times or in tempests, in the days when the darkness and the foe are nameless and familiar, I may not forget that to which my life is committed. Keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve. So what is it that is with you in the moments of your high resolve? Who or what companions you in those moments? Is it God? Is it love? 
Is it the life force itself, the creative, destructive, endlessly changing, healing, transforming, regenerative energies of the world? Is it the ancestors? Is it the silent witness of all those brave souls who came before, who found their courage, who risked for those who came after? In a slightly different context, Dr. King wrote of this question in his 1958 speech called The Power of Nonviolence. He wrote, I am quite aware of the fact that there are persons who believe firmly in nonviolence who do not believe in a personal God. But I believe every person who believes in nonviolent resistance believes somehow that the universe in some form is on the side of justice. Dr. King said that believes that there is something unfolding in the universe, whether one speaks of it as an unconscious process, whether one speaks of it as some unmoved mover, or whether someone speaks of it as a personal God, there is something in the universe that unfolds for justice. And this idea that the universe unfolds for justice echoes the well-known quote by the famous Unitarian minister, Theodore Parker, who wrote, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The ark is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. But from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. Language Dr. King would recast, saying the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice, language that was woven into a rug that lived in the Obama White House. In the story, as Dr. King tells it, when his courage came so close to failing that night, what he needed to hear was not that he would be safe, not that he would win, but that he would not be alone. <clears throat> the same spirit that bends the moral arc of the universe would be with him. And that gave him courage and strength for all the trials that followed. This was a transformative moment for him, one of those before and after life moments. But before that moment could happen, he needed to recognize and acknowledge the state of his own spirit, the fear and the loss of resolve that was happening within him. Dr. King could have refused to recognize his own faltering courage. If his self-image were such that he did not permit himself weakness, if he had practiced denial, then he might never have had that conversation with God, not recognize the crack that was growing in his own foundation. And then he might have hesitated, might have pulled back at the moment when he most needed to be present. He might have crumbled. And so we need self-awareness enough to know what the needs of our heart are. We need to be vulnerable enough to admit just to ourselves those moments when we are afraid. And so courage is also rooted in our vulnerability. Dr. King, recognizing that he was thirsty, went to the well. In his case, he prayed. Going to the well may look different for each of you. My help is in the mountains, said the poet Nancy Wood, where I take myself to heal the earthly wounds that people give to me. Your help may be elsewhere, poetry or music or meditation hiking or tarot or time with the ancestors. What reconnects you to the sources of life and love? What reconnects you to the source of your courage, to the presence you will turn to in the moments when your vulnerability, your merely humanness, feels vast and overwhelming? Our universalist tradition speaks of a love that is faithful a love that continues to hold us and connect us even when we feel most alone, a love that is in the end powerful enough to bend the moral arc of the world toward justice. And so the poet said, when the great plates slip and the earth shivers, look not to more solidity, to weighty slabs, trust more the tensile strands of love that bend and stretch to hold you in the web of life that's often torn, but always healing. 
in these uncertain times when the ground is so unsteady beneath us, when so many things must be risked and chanced as we're walking through this storm. Let us trust in love and let us find the courage to move forward toward our vision of the beloved community, called on by that which is best and truest within us, knowing that in that moment when our courage is most needed, we will not be alone. Blessed be and amen. <laughs>